Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am Linda Hadley, Dean of the Turner College, for those of you who may not know me. And uh, this is our first uh, installment of our Executive Speaker Series for 2018-19. How many of you have been to one before? Great, great. How many of you attended our Student Appreciation or Student Welcome Back event last week? How many of you attended? All right. Those of you who did not attend missed a good time. You missed an opportunity to see some of your professors make real fools of themselves, uh, competing with the students out in the lobby on uh, some really fun games. Uh, we have a big student welcome event in September, and we always have a big student appreciation event in the spring. It's always in April. I don't know the date. Sean, do you know the date offhand? Uh, we'll, we'll tell you at the end. Okay, we'll tell you at the end, I'll get the date. But it's always in April, and it is a student appreciation event where the faculty actually, they cook. They could cook hot dogs and hamburgers for all of the students in the college, and we have a kickball game. Uh, faculty, staff against the students. Usually, the students win, but for the last two years, the faculty has won. So you all have uh, a reputation to defend. So I, I, how many of you think that you might want to participate? We need more than that. We need more than that. It's a good time. It's a good time. Even if you don't play, it's an opportunity to really get, uh, it's, a good, it's good food, good company, and a lot of good laughs. So I want to see you there. Um, what, this executive speaker series, we started some years ago, and it was our goal with the executive speaker series. We say that we bring the boardroom, uh, we bring the boardroom into the classroom, and that is certainly what we're doing today. Uh, how many of you are computer science majors first? Let me ask that. How many of you are computer science majors, okay? And how many of you are information systems, IT, or, or business majors? How many of you are business majors? All right. Uh, well. Uh, the speaker we have today is a real treat for both of you all. It's a really good example of why we thought that it was a good idea at Columbus State University to put our business programs and our computer science programs in the same college. Uh, once you listen to the speaker, I think you'll have a better idea of why that makes a lot of sense. Our speaker today is Mr. Lee Congdon. He is the CIO at Aleutian. How many of you know what Aleutian does? what products they make, all right? How many of you are familiar with Banner? Banner, all right? And what, what we used to call ISIS, and they changed the name to uh, is Banner SIS now. Mm -hmm. uh, student Information Systems. Systems. Student Information mm -hmm. Systems. Well, this is the company that's responsible for that. Uh, in fact, it is the largest provider of software to higher education in the world, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so this is a real treat. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker. He, as I said, is the CIO at Aleutian. Before that, he had similar positions at other companies. You were at Red Hat, mm -hmm. at uh, Capital One. Mm -hmm. What's in your pocket? Is that the one? <laughs> Capital One? Capital One. What's in your wallet? What's in your wallet? Mm -hmm. What's in your wallet? Right. Mm -hmm. What's in your wallet? NASDAQ. Right. And at NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. All right. So someone who has a lot of experience in the field. Uh, he has both a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Computer Science from Purdue University, and he has an MBA from Northwestern University. And I want to thank Sean Russell for all the work that he does in programming this series and in recording it. And I really want to say thank you to Jack Goldfrank. Uh, how many of you? Do, how, how many of you know Dr. Goldfrank? Okay, some of you are probably in this class, but those of you who don't know Dr. Goldfrank, would you stand up? I just want you all to see, Dr. Goldfrank is our executive in residence, and uh, we are uh, deeply um, grateful for him today, to him today, for uh, making this speaker possible. Uh, he has a former business relationship with our speaker today, and I think we were able to get him to agree to come to Columbus State University because of his relationship with Dr. Goldfrank. So I won't take up any more of your time, Mr. Lee Conner. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, with this size group, I'm going to have three natural pauses as I go through this uh, to take questions. But uh, with this size group, I'm happy to take questions at any time. So if you've got anything burning or want to uh, follow up on something, please don't stop me uh, or, or don't hesitate to stop me, rather. So let me first uh, start. I'm going to talk a little bit about a Lucian, not because you're our customer, thank you, and the state of Georgia is our customer, thank you, but uh, as an example of a business that's going through a pretty dramatic transformation that I think a lot of businesses are going through through right now, talk about sort of the history, where what we've done, where we're going, and how we're thinking about it. And it's not an easy journey, but it's a it's really a fun journey, and I'm really glad to be part of it. I'll, I'll talk about that. Then I'll talk a little bit about CIOs and what CIOs do and how uh, information technology plays in the plans of almost every business uh, going forward, probably every business. And then I'll talk a little bit about the practicalities of getting a job, uh, working for an IT company or for a, a related business or for any business for that matter. And I've uh, been hiring lately and, and bringing a few people onto my team both directly and indirectly and how dramatically the job seeking marketplace has changed over the last few years. So we'll talk about that as well. But uh, between those topics, we'll have breaks for questions. And certainly, if you want to ask me any questions as we go along, please stop me. So let me first talk about Elucian. So the, the company is a tech company, uh, probably a little more than 40 years old if you look back to the very beginnings of some of our software. We actually have, in addition to Banner, three other campus systems that we support, acquisitions over the years. The, the final large acquisition was between a firm called Datatel and SunGuard Higher Education probably seven years ago. Um, unlike many corporate mergers, that's actually gone very well. We have a lot of consolidation, a lot of common purpose within the organization. We're all working together. Some of our back office systems still reflect uh, you know, names of systems or uh, solutions, uh, product configurations, and so on that vary slightly. But having gone through a number of consolidation activities, this one's actually been very sort of culturally compatible. And that's often the hard part. You know, you can put the products together, you can put the sales force together, but, but putting the culture together sometimes is tough. And um, thinking back to my Red Hat experience, JBoss was a acqui large acquisition of Red Hat a couple years before I got there. And there were still vestiges five years later of the differences in the organizations, the difference in the style, the difference in purpose. Uh, that were obvious. So one of the things I see at Elucian, and that I saw at Red Hat as well, is mission-driven organization. I've been fortunate to work for some great companies, as the dean mentioned, and uh, the last two, uh, fortunately, are more mission-driven, perhaps, than Citibank, IBM, Capital One. Not that those aren't great places to work, but having a mission at Red Hat of being an open source provider, or having a mission at Elucian of ensuring you're all successful by making our customers is successful, I think really pulls the company together and ultimately helps break the ties on difficult decisions. We were a very capable on-premises software company. And we have strong, long relationships with our customers. And neither we nor our customers were necessarily driving us to change. But as almost always happens in business, the world changed around us. Over the last five years, cloud computing technology has gone from an interesting experiment that might catch on to effectively mainstream for many businesses, whether they're buying software as a service, things like Office 365 or the G Suite from Google to run their email services, whether they're using a, a platform like Salesforce to manage their sales team, or a variety of other software as a service solutions that now provide standard business solutions, whereas in the past you'd have to buy the servers, put them together, install the software, keep it current, and so on. You can just now buy that. So that was a, a, a significant trend that we saw occurring and that our owners saw occurring. So five, six years ago, we realized that we needed to move from being an on-premises software provider, which is, by the way, still the bulk of our business, but we're shifting to become a cloud provider because we think institutions around the world are going to demand those services, and we already see that trend happening. Now, were we a public company 
uh, we're, private, we're private equity held, and there was actually a transition four years ago where our former owners sold us to two new owners. But were we a public company, this would actually be very difficult to do. A major investment of the scale required to take all of our products and make them run in a cloud environment, we chose an Amazon Web Services, would actually be so negatively uh, impactful on margins that it would be very difficult to do if you were a public company. Big investment, millions of dollars, and hard to do if it's going to cause the stock price to go down, um, both because you then become a potentially an acquisition target, your executives don't get paid as much, the, the folks that have stock in the company don't get as much of a return, and so from their perspective, making that magnitude of investment would actually be difficult. But as a private company, we put a business case together, we convinced our owners that it was the right investment to take our products and put them at Amazon. We convinced them there was a market there. We showed them how we were going to get there and they accepted the offer. They agreed that we would spend effectively their money to make that transition long term. They have a long term perspective and see the opportunity for us to become a cloud company. And so as a consequence, we made the investment. It was a multi-year investment, so it required probably two or three years. We completed it, what, a year and a half ago, taking the products and making the technical changes. So, so instead of running in your data center on a Linux server or a Windows server, they now run at Amazon in virtual machines. Uh, the technology, the networking changes, the storage changes, uh, the processing changes required to do that, substantial work. And by the way, it's a journey because even though we've made that initial transition and the products run effectively in those environments, you can always optimize. It's a different kind of environment for reasons we'll talk about a little bit when we talk about the finances, uh, being in an Amazon environment versus being in a data center environment. Products are moved. Now we are making the rest of the corporate changes to make that happen as well. So they're people and process oriented changes. So first of all, it's very different to be a software provider. Your customers report problems, you develop patches, you test them as a suite, you ship out the next version. So you know you get updates on your apps on your phones all the time. That's somewhat the model. When you are a cloud company, you now need to manage hundreds of customers in an environment where you are responsible for their uptime. If a registration is, system is down during registration period, that's actually a pretty bad thing. It will, you will get phone calls. So having that operational ability to provide robust and reliable systems and run them ourselves rather than having our customers run them uh, is one of the things we need to do. And that also implies some other process and operational things like information security, because we have European students and European customers, we need to comply with a very stringent set of rules called GDPR, uh, 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 espoused by the European community, to ensure that people can be taken out, the right to be forgotten is a prominent one. How you can take the people out of the system so they're no longer there, but you have to make business decisions about is that the right thing to do if someone has, for example, earned a degree. Do you agree to take them out of the system or not? And so a lot of process changes associated with that as well. Information security, because our systems are, we're now accountable for providing secure solutions for all of our customers using our cloud products. Helping our customers with the transition. Many institutions have chosen to customize our products to reflect their business processes. Everybody does it slightly differently. Their logos and so on. And so when you have a, a heavily customized customized system, putting it into a standard template turns out to be a lot of work. Both the technical work to move from one to the other, as well as the business process changes because financial aid doesn't want to do it that way, or uh, student success doesn't want to do it that way, or whatever part of the organization. So helping our customers with that transition as well. I also mentioned there are financial implications. One of the advantages of on-premises systems is you know your costs. They're fixed, right? You buy a bunch, roughly fixed. You buy a bunch of servers, you pay electricity and cooling to keep them running, you pay licenses to your, and maintenance to your software vendors, uh, you have staff to support that, that's a relatively fixed number and so on. So over the course of a year or even longer period of time, you know how much that's gonna cost. If you're a, 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 an organization 
corporation that can take advantage of the appropriate accounting, you depreciate that over time and so on. But, but for the most part, you know how much you're going to spend. And for the last 30, 40 years, IT organizations have figured out how to manage that cost effectively. As we make this shift to cloud computing, all of a sudden the world is different because you're on the meter, you're buying gas, you're buying electricity. The more you use, the more you pay. The good side is the less you use, the less you pay. But it means that your business and your systems need to be set up to be on a metered basis, number one. And if you're an organization that capitalizes and then depreciates your equipment, you also need to transition to an operating expense. Every month, every quarter, every year, you're going to get a bill for a fixed amount. And unlike a depreciation where after three or four years, you can still use the asset but not pay for it any longer effectively, all of a sudden, the bills keep coming in. So it changes the financials. And for a lot of organizations that are, particularly organizations that are built and are strong based on managing capital investments, it's hard to shift to OPEX. It's not something you can just flip a switch because it changes your economics fairly dramatically. I think another bit of it is, and this is important as we shift from being a software company where we were hierarchical. I'll talk more about this when I talk about the CIO role, but we were hierarchical. Great people, very collaborative environment, very collegial environment, worked well together. But work sort of got passed down through the management chain. You know, senior leadership told middle management, middle management told first line management, first line management told people what to do, they did a good job, they came back and said, what else can I do, give me some more work. And promotions and responsibility were sort of acknowledged with time and grade, with uh, promotions to a manager title, but not necessarily a large people leadership responsibility. And we had to shift to compete with other cloud companies like Salesforce or Amazon, or and they are both a supplier and a competitor, or Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We had to shift to being much more of a cloud-centric organization. Now you say, well, why would we be competing with LinkedIn? And the answer is war for talent. Very difficult now to hire people with cloud skills, data skills, artificial intelligence skills, and so on. So part of the competition is we have to position ourselves as an employer of choice and with an effective employer brand. So in addition to changing the management style, we're actually rebuilding our facilities around the globe with the bright colors and the foosball tables and the coffee and all that. You laugh, but that is an expectation. Right? That is, to play in the cloud game, you have to have those sorts of capabilities right? to be able to convince people that you're the best place for them to work. So that is a big investment for us as well. And that means changing the leadership culture from that hierarchical model that I described to one in which we encourage people to form cross-functional teams, figure out what the biggest problem is, get a group together that can solve it, make sure you've you know, coordinated with the other groups that are going to be affected, go fix it, and then come back and fix the next one. That gives people responsibility faster, but it also means management has to, in, in both directions, develop a degree of trust so that you can effectively execute in that model. Because you can't double and triple check everything any longer. You have to move fast, be willing to take a few things that get broken along the way, fix them fast, and move on to the next thing. So we're in that leadership transition right now. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my role when I talk about the, the CIO role, but I would say across the enterprise, I feel like we're making good progress. And I encourage you to check. Look at our LinkedIn profiles, looked at our Facebook profiles, looked at, look at our Twitter presence, as well as our website, which we're in the process of rebuilding, and, um, and get a sense of how you think we're transforming from a employer and a provider of choice. Now, I, I'm not surprised that not a lot of you have heard about us. We're not public, and 
uh, we don't sell directly to consumers. So you wouldn't necessarily, you know, we have 2,500 customers and a market opportunity several times that around the globe, but it doesn't necessarily make sense for us to reach out directly to the general public. You probably won't see us buying ads in the Super Bowl because you aren't gonna be the decision makers to decide whether or not you choose our product or not. It's gonna be working with your senior leadership and actually the state in many cases to determine whether or not our solutions are the best for your environment. So at the same time, in that war for talent that I described, we want to be visible and attractive, and I'll talk a little bit about hiring as well. We're gonna make sure that we're out there providing opportunities to folks. So I'll take a breath and say anything that I didn't touch on about Elucian, anything about the business transformation, the final financial transformation, sort of differences in leadership styles, managers really have to trust and let go in this environment. And for some of our long-term managers, it's not an easy thing. Is there a user advantage for the user to go to the cloud-based system? I think so. So, depends, but in general, if you're going to a cloud-based system, you can take advantages of the scale that a large-scale provider will offer. So in our case, us plus Amazon means that you can get a high-speed connection, access anywhere, you don't have to backhaul back, to, if you happen to be in a remote location, you don't have to backhaul back and so on, you can get to it. Plus, um, you know, I think having that, that ability to scale means you can aut take advantage of the automated updates and get new feature function on an ongoing basis rather than waiting until your entity has the, the time to upgrade and test and move to a new version. So I think there are lo lots of benefits in taking advantage of scale. Did that answer the question, yeah. Jack? Okay. Yeah. Well, what do you think about security in the cloud? How secure is it? So it's, you know, I get asked this question a lot. Our view is that security, information security in the cloud is actually more secure. Because, back to Jack's question, from a scale standpoint, Amazon, Google, <laughs> ourselves, Facebook, LinkedIn are under constant attack 24 by seven and need to build the defenses and the capabilities to respond and the intelligence to be out in advance of threats as they occur. It is difficult for smaller organizations to stay fully current, to attract the caliber of information security talent that say a Google must have to stay in business, a Microsoft must have to stay in business. And so I think there are significant scale advantages in, from an information security standpoint in being in the cloud and that you have access to that talent, it's built into the systems, you can focus on the parts of the application that are critical to your business and educating your users about phishing attacks as opposed to worrying about patching the software and ensuring that you're at the latest patch level and watching for the threats as they come up. So our view is it's a dangerous world. One of the things that most CIOs will tell you that's sort of an uncontrollable problem but can be managed is information security. Dangerous world. And so to the extent that you can shift those information security challenges to trusted partners with scale, we think there's an advantage there. But I don't mean to say it's not a threat because information security, very scary situation right now. Let me guess, Craig. So, like, when we log into to review, are we logging into a banner software? Uh, I don't know the specifics of your implementation, but my understanding is where you're moving in Georgia is to a centrally provided banner implementation out of Athens that all of the state affiliated uh, universities will be using. So very similar, you're taking advantage of scale. Instead of being provided by a Lucian running on Amazon, you'll be provided by a central utility in the state of Georgia. It's not view, it's Uber. So Banner, Banner is within Cougar Net. Okay. And then Cougar View yeah. is our, uh, is the whole thing is our uh, learning management system. For okay. Online and Facebook. Uh, that's uh, D2L Bright Space. Oh, okay. Okay. All, all student data is held in Banner. All your, everything that defines you, your profile is in Banner. And I should say, more broadly, we provide solutions for, um, we would call it CRM, uh, but you know, solutions to attract, identify the students you want to attract, to get them enrolled, to get them financial aid, to ensure they're successful, to track their grades, um, to provide for uh, adult learning, 
and also to engage with your alumni, as well as to pay your employees, track your financials, and so on. So a broad suite of, we call SIS, or Student Information Systems, as we touched on earlier, often called ERP, which stands for Enterprise Resource Planning uh, as well. It's a collection of tools. In the marketplace, you'll see most firms either going with an industry-specific, and in, in our case, we're higher education solution, depends upon your industry, or generic solutions would be Oracle provides a generic ERP solution. SAP provides a generic uh, solution. Microsoft provides their business dynamics as a generic solution as well. Yes, sir. Sir, you guys are partnering with uh, any military affiliates like Fort Benning, Fort Stewart, or any kind of like brainstorm because they, of course, government, and that, those are uh, two of the biggest home and base around. Are you guys like saying, well, I know we're information security, but maybe we can learn some or they can learn some from us by comparing notes or whatever on their comsec side yes through uh, you know probably a little different threats mm -hmm. in terms of people typically are still coming at students and employees of universities for example for money rather than nation state attacks yeah. but in multiple environments where we can exchange information with our vendor partners like Cisco and others mm -hmm. as well as local uh, information security events and our owners also sponsor information security because it's so important to us for us and the other portfolio companies to share information and that would be a source for that as well. So, so it's a it's a fine line in information security because um, you want to know as much as you can know, but you also don't want to share secrets with your adversaries. And so, finding the right balance there is is a, a bit of a, a, a tricky process. But in general, you you must gather intelligence from vendors and other providers in order to be effective. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Anybody else about Elucian or the, sort of the general business climate? You know, I, I think one of the exciting things for me is we are making this transition, although arguably we're sort of already a digital company, we are making this transition from being a software company to being a fully digital company with all of our offerings online, and many other businesses are going through that right now. I mean, we were talking earlier today, you know, Marriott will tell you their biggest competitor is Airbnb. Airbnb doesn't have any hotel rooms, right? But they've got an app and they're digital, right? Taxi medallion owners in New York City will tell you their biggest competitor is Uber or Lyft, and they don't own any cars, and they don't hire any drivers, um, although it would be interesting to see how the labor laws shake out in that space. So those sorts of things, becoming a digital entity, any business uh, you know, uh, can be attacked or, uh, you know, Walmart, very successful with supply chain, very competent with information technology, but they will tell you, I'm sure, that their biggest threat is Amazon right now and Amazon's capabilities that they've developed through being able to sell online in ways that Walmart is now playing a bit of catch up as our target and some others as well. So, so back to what I opened with, you know, even though we were doing well, even though we had long relationships with our customers, our products were well regarded and so on, we knew we had to change. And so I think one of the lessons is coming, and what I'd like you to feel on this is never get too comfortable, right? Wherever you're working, whatever you're working on, be thinking about what's coming next. And by the way, they won't always be, they, you know, it's sometimes hard to tell a, you know, a true competitor from a hypothetical competitor. Not everything catches on. You know, there's been a lot of hype about things like blockchain lately, but I don't see a lot of businesses going under because of blockchain competitors just yet. That will probably change in certain niche areas over time, but, but you know, it, even if it's got a lot of hype, it doesn't mean that it's a threat, but trying to differentiate and always be on guard I think is important. So with that, I'm going to move on to CIO. So I'm a chief information officer uh, and have been in this role and uh, at, the, at Red Hat and a divisional CIO at Capital One. Um, the CIO title is, is ambiguous and even more ambiguous, I think, over time uh, lately. 
organizations tend to have CIOs that in some cases they have only responsibility for core IT, you know, running the financial system and the email system. Sometimes they have responsibility for everything in the enterprise. Sometimes you have what's called a chief technology officer or CTO in an organization and that CTO could be anything from the architect and direction setter for technology products. That's the case in our organization, that was the case in Red Hat and really a complementary position. Um, the CTO could own everything, including have a CIO report to them, um, or in some cases the CTO is the person who runs infrastructure for the organization, the person who runs the data centers, the servers, the network, the storage in sort of an on-premises environment, um, and they work for the CIO. In addition to that, companies that are starting down that transformation journey that I alluded to, and sometimes to kickstart that, they created what was called a chief digital officer, a person whose job it was to help the company or the enterprise go digital, to think about, okay, we still have this great product, but our customers are now you know, bidding our product against other products online, and so we need to have an online capability to do that. We need to be cultivating our customers using using CRM, uh, uh, customer relationship management uh, solutions like Salesforce. We need to be identifying our target markets electronically. We need to be using data science to figure out what our most profitable customers are and how to make them more profitable as well as serving them better. So organizations created CDOs, and again, it depends upon a lot of things. What industry I'm in, where I'm positioned, what my corporate culture is, how competent my IT team is, um, whether or not you bring in a new person, whether you promote the CIO into a CDO role, whether you say IT is just operations and you make it all report to a chief operating officer or COO, so a variety of acronyms out there. By, by way of saying a lot of different models in organizations, mine's I think fairly typical for a tech and financial services organization where I spent my career and I'll talk a little bit about it, but also be aware that completely independent uh, financial services firms that do investments, say a Bank of America, will also have a CIO, which is a chief investment officer that helps pick investments. Completely different role, okay? Obviously based on technology, but completely different role. So by way of saying that, the role I'm in I think is pretty typical. It's certainly this very similar role to what I had at Red Hat and similar to the division role I had at Capital One, but CIOs do different things. So, and, and I have some pretty passionate views about this, so I'll tell you what I think is the right answer, but you can always ask questions about different approaches. Um, in my mind, IT organizations are shifting because of the cloud computing phenomena I talked about. It used to be, and will be for a number of years, so if you're pursuing a career in IT or computer science, this is not you know, a, a, a bad thing, although you can look at my tweet stream, I think it went out yesterday, for an article about four or five IT jobs that are going away. Uh, I think they're actually transforming, but you know, if you want to get clicks, you have to write a dramatic headline. So think about about you know, how things will change over time. And in particular, organizations will be hiring people to configure servers, to manage storage, to update databases, to update software, to patch bugs, uh, to deploy new software on premises, et cetera, for a long period of time. But the trend is definitely towards buying those solutions rather than building them yourself. Even though the fixed costs, as I mentioned earlier, have an advantage, and even though you can depreciate over time and potentially gain some, some advantage by stretching them out over time, the reality is there are hidden costs there. You can get stuck in a technology that's no longer relevant. You can end up managing a department of folks that aren't core to the mission of the organization or to its future success, but as you have to have that team because you've chosen this particular solution or this particular application. So, so I think we're going to see IT organizations, the, particularly the ones that are most effective, shift from being really good at technology to being really good at business technology leadership, being business consultants. And so I've got some great technical people on my team. We have given them access to technical education, but we are, and we continue to do, we send them to the Salesforce conferences, we send them to the Amazon conferences, uh, we encourage them to take online education, et cetera, but we're really telling them what you need to be able to do is communicate, influence, 
talk to business people, understand the finances, and make offers to make the business better. And so those are the things that we're focusing on. Now, that's the good news. The challenge, of course, is you don't get a pass on the stuff you're already doing. As I like to say, nobody wants to talk about IT strategy or business strategy when the email server is down. And that is really true. So you need to continue to have operational excellence. And in some ways, you need to get better at your operations over time because you don't want to have the conversation about, well, gee, email or registration was down you know, the afternoon uh, last month that we really needed it to be up and have that conversation with your manager's manager manager or the head of the organization. You want to have the conversation that says, we think if we invest in this technology and do these things, we can move the business forward. And we had a, I think, a fairly significant success in just a simple example. You know, we had a conglomeration of uh, video tools uh, in, in uh, Elucian that were, you know, WebEx, BlueJeans, uh, Intercall, and a variety of other tools. And we actually, earlier this year, took folks from that collection of of tools that weren't uh, Adobe Connect that weren't necessarily consistent nor used nor cost effective across the organization and worked with the organization to move them to one solution we chose Zoom other organizations choose different things and we're now getting very strong participation in video meetings across the organization we've got folks engaged because we have a lot of remote folks probably 40% of our employees work remote in some fashion and we're across multiple sites around the globe so being able to see somebody face to face means you can get a sense of their demeanor, get a sense of their emotions, and you can also get a sense that they're not doing email with the conference call on mute, which happens a lot. So having that in place means that I think we've been able to drive much more engagement across the organization by a simple thing like providing a video tool and basically making that default for all of our meetings. So people now do video meetings one-on-ones, large groups, company-wide. And I think that changes the tone of the organization from a voice on the speakerphone to a person that you look in the eye across, you know, on your laptop or in, in the conference room. So I think that's made a significant difference. Another area where we're working right now is to do the same thing with chat tools. We've got half a dozen chat tools. Chatter, which is from Salesforce, Skype from Microsoft, Teams from Microsoft, Slack, WhatsApp, and a variety of others. And Everybody wants, well, many folks want a common chat tool. Nobody wants to change, right? They all want the one they're using already. And so we're going to try and orchestrate a common set of chat tools across the organization. I mention that because, at least in IT, the use of Slack has transformed the way we communicate. <coughs> when we started, we were point to point. We had some video, some voice. But by using a channel-based tool like Slack, we've been able to drive sort of engagement across the organization, defaulting to open, and driving for some of those ownership and self-forming teams that I talked about earlier. And I think that's been a significant advantage for us. So what do CIOs do? Well. I think first and foremost is what I was just touching on. I need to make sure I've got the right people working well together with our business partners on the right things. So it's a people job. I like to tell people that I would be dangerous making technology decisions. I, uh, as, as you heard from the dean, I was a computer scientist uh, by training and I love the technology, but I'm not close enough to any one of those technical decisions to make a good one. So, and we make hundreds of technical decisions every day in my organization. So it's my job to make sure I've got people in the organization that I can trust to make those decisions and that they trust me not to undercut them when they make a mistake and that to reinforce them when they make the right decision. So first of all, coaching the people, ensuring we've got the right team, giving them growth opportunities, being willing to grow them and let them go to another job in the organization or even to another part uh, or to another company. I just lost a couple of good folks to uh, other companies, but they're satisfied alums and hopefully we'll be able to hire them back in a couple of years with a different set of experiences and a broader perspective. Um, I'd say the second thing is, and I touched on this earlier, process improvement. You really need to think about continuously simplifying. You know, one of the challenges you run into in IT is 
your legacy will drag you down. It's getting better and the cloud helps a lot because your cloud providers are forcing you into a cadence of upgrades, which you might not do, might be, not be able to justify yourself. But you still end up with that, I mean, system running on Windows 2008 that you need to run this report that you have to have the report because the executive expects the report. And so unless you put pressure on those legacy applications to get them shut down, you're going to spend more and more of your time on money, uh, time and money on things that really don't matter that much to the business. Because candidly, you could probably get by without that report. Or more likely, you could certainly format it in a different way and get the same information. But until you force that issue and start to shut down your old stuff, you will continuously get held back by that technology tail. And so an important part of process improvement is, first of all, pruning the legacy and replacing it with modern stuff. And then as your organization changes changes and scales, improving your ability to manage changes, improving your ability to manage projects, improving your ability to manage finances, so you've got growing capabilities over time. So process improvement. And I put in that process improvement bucket the fact that if the, you know, the email server has to be up. And if Microsoft isn't doing the job, I was seeing a little post earlier today on Slack that we're having some sign-on problems with email. So you need to keep your vendors, you need to have quarterly business reviews, keep your vendors honest and make sure they're delivering good service to you as well. That's part of that process improvement bit. Fundamentally, you need to enable your business. You need all the things I've been talking about. You need in IT to make sure, as an IT leader, that you are directing your energies towards making your enterprise successful. So for us, that means we've got what we call IT business partners, my leadership team and some of the senior folks across the organization, aligned with marketing, aligned with sales. My, I'm the IT business partner for our CEO, uh, aligned with finance, aligned with HR, and so on so that they are sitting in those staff meetings they are understanding the business problems of those organizations they are helping those organizations sort out what they should do with technology and even saying I got it and solving the technology problem for them so enabling the business I think is an essential part of the CIO role and then last investing for the future placing a few bets I mean we're making some bets on enterprise architecture we think we need one because we're continuing to grow and to integrate our systems we are placing a bet on an integration hub because we think we need that um, I would expect over the next few months to place some bets on artificial intelligence we're not quite there yet but we can see some places we're going to need that and we're already looking at the suppliers and providers that might get us there we've recently placed some big bets on cloud providers like Amazon and I would expect us to also make some investments to get to Microsoft Cloud Azure in this time frame as well so starting to think about the future you can't spend all your money and all your resources on that but you need to be always looking forward so I think that's an important part as well I could talk for a long time about this so let me let me take a break and say are there any specific questions about what the IT leadership what the CIO is responsible for and yes sir how fast is uh, the market for AI stuff advancing in some places dramatically in the mainstream, not yet, would be my view. The places I see affecting us are going to be call centers and um, data science first. So being able to draw deeper insights from the data we already have um, and being able to provide automated solutions for call centers and trouble ticketing and so on. I think built into some of this cloud solutions like Microsoft and other providers are gonna provide um, connections similar to you see you know friend offers on Facebook but you know this person has been you know posting a lot on business topics that are similar to your interests and making those connections will come to us automatically as well um, I do believe that there are you know large enterprises that are deeply embedded in the data science and artificial intelligence bit not so much in our core competency or requirements although we expect our customers to ask more and more what you'll hear referred to as the Internet of Things smart home switches sensors data being gathered from lots of different places and consolidated to draw those insights so those are all areas where I see things moving pretty fast 
And then outside our space totally is the whole biological uh, and uh, health sciences uh, data collection and, and monitoring that I think is growing and changing pretty rapidly too. So did I answer your question? I have another question. About sure. That. Uh, so I read something a while ago about uh, AI and trying to get it to develop its own software in a way. Mm -hmm. How many years do you think it would be before a technology like that would influence? I think there's some influence already. I think I'll make the general statement that software development can be a asocial repetitive task doesn't have to be, but like report writing and some other sorts of things can be. And so if you're not interacting socially or with your business partners or setting direction and you're doing repetitive tasks, those things will be automated over time, whether or not it is a manual task or a mental task. So, you know, a classic example is radiology. You can pretty quickly train a program to recognize a spot on a radiogram that as well or better than a human radiologist. It's a repetitive task, it isn't that social. I would say the same thing about certain types of software development. Where it's innovative, where it's creative, whether it's setting a new direction, I think that software development, that creative bit is going to continue for a while, but I do expect automated testing, automated development for routine and repetitive types of software activities, you know, it will continue to evolve. Yes, sir. What is your stance on like ethical use of like big data? So yeah. as you know, we're in a society where like we're always data is always being collected by Google and Amazon and these and, and Axiom and firms you haven't heard of, yeah, yeah, exactly. And health, your and your healthcare providers and et cetera, yeah. Like a company, like where do you understand that? Yeah, so um, first of all, comply with the laws and regulations. So from our perspective, whether it's GDPR uh, or anyone, uh, you know, Virginia has a fairly stringent set of regulations, Texas has a fairly stringent set of regulations. If you are doing payments with credit cards, the payment card industry has a fairly stringent set of regulations. Our customers hold us to a high standard. So our first, first answer to that question would be, comply with the appropriate laws and regulations for the jurisdictions. They vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Second bit would be, we would take the high road. We would, and by the way, good news there too is our customers expect us to take the high road. So we're not in a situation where we observe you know, uh, subterfuge or a, a situation where data is, people are attempting to use data for nefarious purposes. So that's a good thing. And I think we would say, take the high road and be transparent, visible, and ensure that we are protecting privacy, confidentiality of the data, and as I said, following the laws and regulations. So that would be our default approach. Yes. Hi, um, you talked about when um, we were discussing leadership about how you would like for workers to be able to communicate and influence along with a couple of other things. Mm -hmm. So those are some soft skills, but what about the hard skills? Because when you're hiring and you're looking at resumes and you're interviewing, um, those might be good things, but they don't. They're not going to significantly impact those day-to-day -day functions. So, like knowing Java and knowing SQL, yeah. things like that. So, can I hold that until I talk about finding a job, and then and then hold me if if I don't answer your question, I'll come back to it. Okay, uh, call, call me back. Report you and where are they located. I'm sorry? How many people report to you? Uh, I have 100 people, there's so about 3,000 people at Ellucian. Um I have 100 in IT plus another 30 contractors. And then, you know, sort of by implication, Microsoft's got a lot of people working for us on Office 365 and so on. But, but direct reports, about 100. Um, primary location for IT in Ellucian is Reston, Virginia, uh, about 20 miles west of DC. Uh, and I probably have 25 or 30 folks there. Um, I have 20 people in Bangladesh. Bangalore, India. I have about 25 people in Malvern, Pennsylvania. Uh, ties back, sort of two headquarters ties back to that acquisition I mentioned seven or so years ago. Um, and then uh, other locations, I've got a person in uh, Dublin and a few, uh, Puebla, a suburban Mexico City and a few other locations. Um, and then the contractors tend to be in India and in uh, Reston. 
<coughs> excuse me, um, organization as a whole is about 3,000 people. Our largest location is Bangalore. Ruston is the second largest. Um, I would say, you know, strategically, I don't see large growth in the IT organization as the company continues to grow, but rather by switching those skills from folks building systems to folks leveraging vendors to deliver business solutions, I'm hoping to keep our growth in the IT organization in terms of number of people relatively low, but their leverage to be much higher. Thank you. Did that answer the question? Sure did. Thank you. Does the CISO report to you? Yes, he does. Yeah. How, how big is your security team? Uh, roughly 20 people. So, and um, it's a dangerous world, as I said. I mean, the the ongoing threats are substantial, and so we need to protect our products, we need to protect our environments, and we need to help our customers protect themselves, as well as educating our internal users. So yes, information security is a challenge, and that 20 people is included in the 100. <coughs> Excuse me, any other questions? Let me briefly then talk about, so I made, uh, I hired a new CISO uh, uh, within the last year. Uh, I am currently looking for a VP of IT, um, and we're getting close. We've got some final interviews this week. And I just hired uh, an executive assistant as well. And in my organization, we probably hired another 10 or 12 people over the course of the uh, last, uh, this year. So let me tell you, it is different than I remember it. Um, when I went to, uh, and by the way, this is job growth, uh, the, the VP of IT position who runs my business application, so HR, finance, sales, et cetera, the websites and so on, um, had been at Lucian for 20 some, 23 years. Um, you know, we're teaching growth mindset. We're teaching people to look for new opportunities. He saw a new opportunity, win-win opportunity for him to go and potentially be a CIO. He wanted to get some experience in another industry. Opportunity for me to maybe make a change in the organization. I chose not to make a change in the organization, but to backfill with somebody who's got a different set of skills. So win-win for us, even though he's a great guy, we all hate to lose him, but you know, we wish him every success and maybe I can hire him back in a few years. But um, my recruiter, internal recruiter, and it's different, particularly for you know executive level positions. You often went to an external search firm and and had them spend months combing through people, making phone calls, and so on, and come back with some carefully presented resumes and so on. So the Friday before we announced it on Monday, my recruiter calls me up and says, "You know, I've looked on LinkedIn and I've got 25 people in D.C. that I think could be candidates for this role. Is it okay if I start to call them over the weekend? Because that's when you, you get you get in touch with busy people at nights and weekends." So I thought about it and said, "Well, you know, the uh, you know we wanted to keep the announcement confidential so that people didn't hear about it before. You know, you want to have a structured communication and so on, so people don't worry about change and so on. So on that basis, we then said." I told him, go ahead and make the calls. I decided to take the risk. So by Tuesday, he had given me a list of five people that he had spoken with that met the criteria. Do I need? No, sir. Oh, okay, sorry. That met the criteria, and I went through the resumes. We brought three of them in. We kept the pipeline open. We brought three other people in, and over the course of a couple of weeks, we went through a series of video interviews, first round interviews, and now we're bringing the finalists in for face-to-face -face interviews. So over the course of three or four weeks, we were very quickly able to move through the process. Um, I mentioned, I'll mention LinkedIn again. We picked the people because of their LinkedIn profiles. So back to your question about skills, and depending on what, this is an executive position, so this is a manager of managers, so, <clears throat> so we were looking for a broad range of experience. You know, some of it really is, you've had enough time and enough different places you work to see a lot of different things, so you bring that value to the table as well. But at all levels, people are now looking at your online profile, particularly in a technical role, if you're looking for a technical job in your own IP, people are gonna look on GitHub to see what open source projects you've uh, contributed to. They're going to look on Stack Overflow to see your engagement with a community and whether you're answering questions and whether you're giving good answers, by the way. Um, if you've got a, if you've started an open source project or you have some passion, 
or, or at least set up your own website, you will probably help yourself as well. And LinkedIn is sort of the default. So making sure that you've got a solid LinkedIn profile that highlights your skills, that you know Java, you know JavaScript, you know Python, you've developed this sort of project. It's worth investing in that stuff. Um, it's also worth investing, in my opinion, particularly as you get to more senior roles. Jackie Yaney, who is our chief marketing officer, is a huge proponent of this, and she's convinced me as well. I uh, curate a tweet stream and a LinkedIn post stream every day of I try and find five articles that are relevant to technical or changes in society is one of my theme, uh, driven by technology, that I post every day to build up a brand. And our firm then can use that both to build that employer brand I talked about before, because we can add posts of you know, the fun activity where we did the scavenger hunt uh, in the building, uh, or uh, we had a impromptu mini golf tournament, or those sorts of things to sort of build up that employer brand, but also to our customers talking about the presentation that some of my colleagues made it at the Georgia IT uh, event earlier this week, we can post those as well. Well, so we build, a, build an online brand and use that to promote yourself and to promote your employers. Now, not everybody's there yet. If you're working for an intelligence agency, that's probably not a good thing, right? Um, but if um, the, the, the CIA, a couple of years ago, a great first tweet was, we neither confirm nor deny that this is our first tweet, right? So, so I think that you know, if you've got that sort of offbeat you know, ability to communicate in a social context, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, to a degree, Facebook. I mean, I'm still a little more on the personal side on Facebook and certainly on Instagram, but, but those tools are what employers, particularly tech employers, are looking for right now. So basic advice to get a job is pick the five or ten places you'd like to work. I mean, it's okay for serendipity, it's okay for an opening to come along, but decide whatever your criteria are. I wanna be in this geography, I wanna work in this industry, I wanna work for this company. When I came out of school, I wanted to work for IBM. But pick what you want to do. I mean, don't overlook that step, right? I mean, it's great to keep your filters open and to be looking for opportunities that come along. But decide what you want to do, particularly as you gain experience and responsibility, because you will want to be developing contacts and awareness of that employer and their challenges and how your skills can help them solve their business challenges. And that's ultimately the story you want to tell, whether it's you need a Java programmer, and I know Java well, or you need somebody that can develop a new product line, and I'm a product person. So be thinking about setting that tone. Network, develop your LinkedIn, certainly network, and others as well, your public persona. Um, and in other venues as well, like d joining an open source project or something like that, again, if you're a technical person. Um, track the employers, follow their Twitter streams, follow their LinkedIn streams. They will share a lot of information with you um, on their websites, their press releases as well, so that you will get a sense of what's happening there and you can position, again, your skills and your interests. And it is much more powerful to come into an interview saying, I've always wanted to work here, here's why, and here's what I can contribute, than what's your first question, All right? So think about that. I'm done. Um, any other questions I can answer about job hunting? Yes. So you, you mentioned uh, automating like the asocial. Yeah. Is, are recruiters moving towards like uh, automated uh, Indeed searches? This is a mixed one. So, you know, the other example I saw was, you know, bartenders may not mix drinks, but you'll still have bartenders because you need somebody across the bar to talk to. Same thing, I think, with recruiters. <laughs> not to demean the recruiting profession, but, you know, I think there'll be more and more keyword searches, automated filters, identifying through artificial intelligence and other tools a likely match, but you still need a person to engage and convince somebody to, you know, take a step back from what they're doing. You know, they're probably buried in a project or saying, well, can you take some time and come in and talk to us? Um, so I think you'll still, I think recruiting will be increasingly sophisticated tools that are automated, but it's not a social because you also need a person that you can talk to, trust and confidence to go through the, the process. So, yeah. 
I'm just about out of time. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, on the LinkedIn thing, you mentioned that you daily curate five articles. Yeah, yeah. That sounds kind of uh, time consuming for a CIO. So I wonder How do I do that? that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but also, um, what, what about a different approach where you, on a weekly basis you write maybe a one page article and, and people follow that? Yeah, so that's hard for me. I mean, if you can do that, I think that's great. Um, when I say curate, I read, and Jack and I were talking about this earlier, I read many more publications than I used to because I get the email feeds, I go to the websites and so on. And so I can go through the process. I use a tool called, two tools. My firm uses a LinkedIn feature, not publicly available, but you know you can pay for it, called Elevate, where it allows you to curate content within your organization. You get a set of news feeds, you broadcast it to other people, they can share it uh, you know, on their LinkedIn feeds and so on. You get stats back from how many engagements you got and so on. So I use that for the stuff that I post specifically on higher education and education topics in general. Then I use a tool called Buffer, which is a, a queuing tool which enables me to schedule things in advance. So when I read an article over the weekend, like the ones that are going up to, as we speak are ones I probably read on Saturday or Sunday and queued up then. And you'll see in our New York Times, Wall Street Journal, you know, Washington Post, The Economist. I mean, you know, and the, the things I would be reading anyway, when I see th something that's consistent with my themes and my interests, I just buffer it. And then it pops up a day or two later. So that's, that's the model. To your point about writing a blog, I think it's very hard. The first one's easy, the second one's good, but you get to the third or fourth one, you know, you, re you have to be really motivated, you have to be passionate about it, and that doesn't work for me. I think if it works for you, it's absolutely great. My niece, or my, I guess, second cousin, technically, whatever, however the relationship things work, is like writing for Medium now and doing a very nice job of some very interesting topics. She only does it occasionally, but, she is a you know relatively new employee of Log Me In in Germany and seems to be using that to build her employment brand very effectively. And so if you can do it, maybe not even weekly, just periodically, I think that can be healthy as well. Did I answer your question? I think all of you can tell why I, I was kind of drawn to Mr. Cogden in Raleigh. We were both kind of commuting <laughs> partially because you never have a dull conversation. It was, uh, we, 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 we solve more world problems than there are. Okay. Right, some twice, but, that's uh, right. I, it's really uh, it's an honor to have you come. Back thank you, thanks. I just want to thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, thank you.